Our first speaker this morning is a legislative and policy counsel with TAC, the Treatment Advocacy Center, part of a team of advocates working to improve state and federal commitment laws and promote evidence-based policies to positively affect those with severe mental illness. Her prior work includes serving as a public defender in Henry County, Georgia, promoting college and career readiness with the Scholarship Academy, and advancing community servant leadership through AmeriCorps Atlanta. She received her Juris Doctor from Florida A&M University, and she is here today to challenge the current mental health system on behalf of those too sick to choose their own continuum of care. She is a former professional actress who gave up her career to help advocate for her brother. Please welcome back to the stage, Sabah Muhammad for her talk, Advocacy Begins in the Margins. I was in New York City in 2012 doing what they call living my best life. I left Georgia to expand my acting career and it was going very well. I was a union actor, a working actor, which meant I only had to wait tables sometimes. <laughs> I was preparing for my very first invitation only industry showcase when suddenly I just could not get to rehearsal on time. And that was strange because normally I was one of those skip from the train, 20 minutes early is on time. But in those six weeks between rehearsal and showtime, the calls from home from my two youngest sisters and my mother grew from worried to panicked to terrified. Our brother had a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia and he was growing more disorganized in thought and deteriorating each day. In the years prior, we hadn't been able to get him into any treatment. The delusions, his delusions, that people were tracking his thoughts and movements through his eyes were real to him. It wasn't denial. It was knowing, also known as anashipnosia, or a lack of insight. He knew his skin was covered in scales. He knew our mother was somehow no longer his mother. And it was something wrong with us for thinking it was an illness. Shamefully, at that point, I didn't believe in mental health. I believed in hard work. That's why I was in the union. That's why I was going to land an agent in this showcase. I worked hard. I didn't need therapy until I had my first panic attack in the fitting room of the Lincoln Square Gap. Now, there was nothing particularly triggering about the jeans that I was trying on. <laughs> but in that small, enclosed space with nothing but my worried reflection staring back at me, it suddenly became difficult to breathe. And the more I tried to take a breath, the more my lungs became fist in my chest. Soon I was on the floor, sobbing for what I thought was no reason at all. And from then on, I dragged from point A to point B, dragged to rehearsal. Then I found out that my two youngest sisters had to leave my mother, had to move away from our childhood home so they could leave my brother and finished the school year in a stable environment. After that, I slogged. I barely even spoke when I arrived to rehearsal. My scene partner, used to my loquacious spirit, looked at me and said, well, what's wrong? I'm fine, I lied. I hadn't told anyone at that point about my family, about my brother. When anyone asked, I said, we're fine. She wasn't buying it. She looked me in the eyes and said, I know you're not okay. Again, the tears started and would not stop. With a few weeks until showtime, I ruined rehearsal. But she was patient. She didn't have the answers, but she did advise me to start with faith. And the only thing I had faith in that, in that time was my hard work. You would not beat my work ethic. See, not only had I moved to New York on some dream, I'd majored in film and, tele and te TV production at Georgia State University when the only other person in my family to attend college was my mother. Together, we were first-generation college students. 
She graduated from Georgia State University with a master's in education in 1995. And in 1999, I entered Georgia State as a college freshman. You were not going to get in the way of my hard work, not even panic attacks. And ironically, because I was in the union, I had health care. I was able to see that therapist that I didn't believe in for the very first time. The showcase came and it was great. Everything went well. I was personally introduced to my New York agent. And when I shook her hand, I smiled a smile I know was fake. Ugh. On the inside, I knew that my family was falling apart and I didn't know what to do about it. So I left it, left the agent, left the industry, left New York City for what I thought was a small break to figure things out. I did not know that I was leaving everything I knew to take on a mental health system where the majority rules and minorities suffer. Mental health in America is a police state. A treatment advocacy center state survey shows that in 44 states, there are more individuals with a diagnosis of severe mental illness receiving treatment while incarcerated, not while in psychiatric hospitals. And that was the question that just kept me up at night. Why the police? My brother was a charismatic star running back. Coaches from all over the state wanted him on their team. But at the end of the night, you could find him sitting at the foot of my brother's bed, rubbing her feet while they talked about their day. And then we just were forced to watch him decline, to watch him pull away from school, family, friends, football, to lose the ability for lucid conversations. And the response was police. According to the language of the Georgia Emergency Psychiatric Evaluation Law, because my brother could not volunteer because he was too sick to volunteer for the help he so desperately needed, our only resource was to wait for imminent threat of danger. Imagine that concerning your loved one and the rest of your family, call us back when someone is about to die. And even then, medical professionals won't answer that call. We will send police. That's the untenable space Georgia families like mine are forced to navigate. And just this year, when the Georgia Senate had the chance to strike the word imminent from the language to get more Georgians into treatment before imminent danger, to reduce the need for police intervention, they refused. In the state where Anthony Hill was shot by his first responder, Officer Olson, the imminent standard remains. Now contrast that to my access to treatment. Able-bodied people with well-paying jobs and education have potentially the chance to see a medical professional within hours. But the 5.6% of Americans diagnosed with a severe mental illness, not one of them experiences insurance parity. Treatment advocacy center numbers show that half of them, like my loved one, simply go untreated. And when that happens, they are pushed to the furthest margins of society, where they are policed and abandoned because of their illness. Within that statistic, not because we're black and brown, but because of our society's continued allegiance to the system of racism, families like mine are 0.5% more likely to be shot by police because a treatment advocacy center study shows that individuals with a diagnosis of severe mental illness are 16 times more likely to die in a police engagement. And when you're black and brown, 
you're more likely to experience escalation and not de-escalation. More likely to be misdiagnosed and least likely to receive the best medication. That's what it's like to be marginalized. Laws are made about you, not for you or with you. The status quo sees you as other, so you're unworthy. Everything about you, from the way your hair grows to your zip code, has been given a derogatory name by those who have crowned themselves correct. If you're someone with a diagnosis of severe mental illness, it means the status quo has written you off. And that reveals so much more about the status quo than anything else. As someone who vacillates between status quo and marginalized, I know where the harm resides. Too many of us in the status quo think we are the singular model for success. We think we're the prototype. And the standard for us in the status quo is misery. We're not living our best lives because we're too busy justifying this broken system and policing the people who don't adhere to it. Sure, we want you to succeed, but we want you to walk our footsteps and walk our path to success, even if you don't walk. A well-adjusted status quo doesn't want anyone calling the police for access to healthcare. A well-adjusted status quo would have made all walkways rampways by now. A well-adjusted status quo wouldn't know that people experiencing homelessness in their zip code are their neighbors, not strangers in the neighborhood. God has not given out high fives to a status quo that drives past Skid Row on their way to Coachella or Rodeo Drive. A well-adjusted status quo will and must connect treatment need to healthcare, not career and not profit. But there is hope. We don't need perfect people to keep justifying this imperfect system. Imperfect people can build perfect systems. Imperfect people like actors who don't believe in mental health. We can build a system where a young black kid with a diagnosis of severe mental illness is taken into treatment at the earliest possible moment of intervention, not taken to jail after we've watched them deteriorate. We can't just change the last 20 years, but we can face them with truth and reconciliation and look forward to the next 20 years of mental health care. And we can best do that by starting in the margins because that's where the most help is needed. And we do that by turning to face our blind spot. That's what I've learned on my journey to severe mental illness advocacy. After I left the entertainment industry, I made a commitment to take jobs that served my community. Uh, I was a, that's how I became an AmeriCorps fellow assigned to George Washington Carver High School in Atlanta, Georgia as a college readiness coach. My job was simple. I was to facilitate a roster of about 200 students, high achieving students that would receive a $4,000 scholarship upon graduation. And I best did this by hosting career and college readiness events for that roster. But those events were open to the entire campus. I considered all the students mine, almost. There were those students, the ones down corridors, behind stairwells, maybe wearing ankle monitors, those students I kept my eyes on my destination and walked past those students. I, I could not help those students. They weren't on track to graduate. I didn't have the time or the resources. That was for their actual teachers. But then I walked campus with an actual teacher and I saw that they also kept their eyes on their destination, focused away from those students. Oh, my blind spot was illuminated. We can't all be doing this. I had to do something, but I didn't, I didn't know what. I thought maybe I'll just speak, make up an opening line. Hey, get to where you're supposed to be. 
Ooh, they fired back. Can't even repeat the language here. <laughs> and you know what? That was my fault because I tried to police them. I had to go back and be better, but I also had to do better in here because had they been my shiny roster students, I would have called them by name. New opening line, new opening line. Are you all all right? Well, they were ready to come for me again, but then they heard the concern. We good was the answer, and they walked away. And I went back every day, and then they got used to seeing me come, and they go, okay, okay, we'll leave. But I didn't just want them down some other corridor. I made a plan. I was going to be prepared. I came back the next week armed. I walked right up to them and offered them Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> the next day, my office was full of students. I, change was going to happen. I didn't know how, but they were out of my blind spot telling me about their needs. I wasn't barking expectations. I even got a call from one of the four principals, and normally I had to chase them down like rock stars. Now they were calling me. It was not good news. It was a warning. Those students are not allowed in the project grad office. Those students are trying to take advantage of you. Those students are not your students. That's what it means to be marginalized. When the evidence shows that one size fits all does not work, the system that keeps serving the least amount of people is justified, given autonomy, as if we can't just change it. And when I didn't immediately remove those students from my office, who do you think showed up to enforce the system? The police. Suddenly, college readiness was criminalized. The circumstances so matched the marginalized fight I'd inherit through racism, it matched the marginalization my family inherited trying to get access to severe mental illness treatment. And here it was again in the school system. I was defeated. I was too late to save my brother, couldn't empower any other families. I might as well just go back to acting. But then something unexpected happened. Students not on my roster start to trickle in my room in the mornings and after school and during their lunch break. And they got wind on campus that the college readiness coach was listening or that she had cookies. <laughs> but that's how I met Renee. Renee. Renee didn't qualify for my roster, but she wanted to go to college. But because Renee had a two-year-old, the adults in her life had already told her that college was not a realistic expectation. Renee and I would just sit and talk, and eventually I was able to find other outside scholarships that matched her lifestyle. In the end, Renee earned a $14,000 scholarship from the Bill Manis Good Samaritan Foundation in Atlanta, Georgia. When you reach into the margins, Illuminate your blind spot beyond the people you deem worthy. You empower more people with access to their needs. This model may have been in the school system, but it's there for mental illness system, politics, housing, anywhere, any system where the majority rules and minorities suffer. We all know who the marginalized are. We walk past them with our eyes straight ahead. We shame them. We blame them from their, for their condition, never the unbending status quo. We limit our compassion by often projecting our ability as their failure. But when we plan, when we face those imperfections, we can correct them and eventually get to the answers. Because if the answers were in the status quo, we would have found them by now. That's where all the experts are. 
That's how imperfect people will build a perfect system. But we just have to want to. Want to advocate for marginalized people. Want to advocate for people with a diagnosis of severe mental illness. I stand here on this stage from the margins with a law degree. But it's my brother's lack of access that reveals the true temperature of American values. There is no value in applauding me and then turning a blind eye to black people being abandoned and policed in the margins. There is value in advocating for that 5.6% of the population that you may never see. Some of our strongest bonds are born of relationships between strangers. Seed of creation kind of depends on it. It doesn't matter how small or big a role someone will play in your life. There is no reason that any of us should have to scrounge and conjure bootstraps and claw our way from a terrible place just to be here. I left the entertainment industry and now I find myself back on stage again. I've stayed committed to therapy in my community, no panic attacks while planning for this speech. And I can smile a real smile now because I have faith in something so much bigger than hard work. I have faith in something so much bigger than me. We can do this. We can reach into the margins, illuminate our blind spot, and ensure that everyone has access to health care, even the sickest of us. How many encounters will you have today? How many encounters have you already had that could have benefited from everyone having access to better mental health care? All the encounters that make up your life. How will that excess benefit you? How much better will you be when at the end of the day, you're your best and you're not depleted and you're there for your family? Because when we reach out into the margins and help those that we can't see, the people we ultimately end up saving are the ones already under our own roof. Thank you. Sabah Mohammed.